You're listening to the Pursuing Alpha podcast, hosted by Charles Brandon Snyder. Hey, I appreciate you coming on, Jeff. It's been a, I think I asked you maybe last year to come on with this. It's been a little bit of time and you're, you're such a busy dude. And that's that really is a testament to how busy and how good you do in your job. So take a few seconds and kind of introduce yourself. I think this is going to be a great conversation. I've been, especially for people out in West Texas, I think this is going to be eye-opening of kind of what you do in your industry and how the industry is changing a little bit. Okay. So Jeff Miller, owner of Forefront Agronomy, and uh, we're based out of Plainview, Texas, do uh, sell seed to farmers, uh, mostly corn and grain sorghum with some cover crop seeds mixed in there. And then we run an agronomy business that um, helps manage those, those crops from fertility, water, um, starting to utilize precision ag and all those kind of things. Yeah, to, we got to uh, talk about that later. To, uh, you know, to help get the most out of, or the biggest bang out of the buck for, for what a guy spends with us. So that's uh, that's kind of the gist of it anyway. Sweet. So so I want to dive into that because I think that's the most interesting part is what is precision ag? It's basically, to cut it down, is splitting, uh, taking a field, for example, and splitting it up into miniature fields and managing those accordingly. And uh, in doing that, what we've been able to do is to save money. We've been able to make um, higher, know, yields. higher yields, better quality, you know, all those kind of things together. To break that back down, because that, that's a lot to unpack. So um, so I'm going to say it, it like I am not an expert in ag other than I manage a lot of guys ag money, right. right? You know what I'm saying? So how I understand it is that you, they've, you're a part of, and they've implemented technology into farming to the point where you can actually measure a section, a quarter section, and y'all map that on a digital scale, right? And saying this little tiny part of this half section of land needs extra water because it's a little less and this needs more and nutrients to water to everything goes into that. And you're actually being able to read that how. Uh, so there's lots of things that go into that. One of them is uh, imagery from satellites. Uh, That's so cool, by the way. We, we're starting to utilize drones. Uh, the problem with drones is, is the scalability of that, but we can really dial into something if we see something on a, on a satellite scale. Uh, boots on the ground is part of that and then just the data that comes that's generated off of whether it be the the uh, electrical conductivity maps that we're pulling the soil samples that we're pulling the tissue samples or you know your planter runs across it it's reading information and and uh, telling you how many seeds you put out there at this you know in this particular spot versus that spot same with your sprayer going across it and same with your harvester going across it so it's really just a stack of, of layers of data um, pretty of much data yeah and, and you know i kind of look at it as i don't know if you ever watched the, the movie moneyball but yeah. you know baseball is is using the analytics to drive the decisions instead of it being like we used to do it and kind of you know touch winging the field. it yeah, yeah. Hey, and you... there's still you know we need to do some of that too because there's there's still the art of it but we've really taken that science aspect of this and that's such level. a great conversation to unpack because I look at a lot of different ways inside of there being outside looking in. And the major way that I look at it is you can't, you have to normalize the new, right? So you can't abandon what's been in practice for hundreds of years in the ag industry. I mean, that's, that's kind of sacrilegious in a certain right. aspect, yeah, right? There is a lot of tradition there and it's good tradition. I mean, it's, it's got us to where we are today. Right. But now we're starting to add a little bit of technology, adding in some of the stuff that you're doing into it. And I look at it like a way, like I, I was in a, a conference call a couple of days ago where he's the ex CEO of one of the the largest financial firms in the country. He left there and now he's in a co-op, which we'll talk about co-ops here in a little bit, I'm sure, right? He was He's in a co-op of insurance producers that it's all like we fund it and we do it. And, and he was the CEO of a major, major insurance and wealth management broker dealer. I mean, he's, you know, top five, top 10 guys. And I asked him what his belief that where the industry is going in that industry, which correlates to what you're doing, it, it, it's all in data. It is, he goes, Brandon, if, as soon as we get data to the level where people can internalize data, 
put a face on it or, or, or some, some type of skin on it where you can actually parse that data out to whatever you're needing on that field or, or in that um, client data is what you're looking for. It, it's just going to make everything that so much availability to be able to make a decision easier and more effectively, right? More and, informed. More informed. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a great thing. And that's been in the ag industry for a little bit now, though, hasn't it? Well, I mean, we were really the first people to to implement auto steer, so GPS, you know, driven technology, and that was a, you know, like a 95% adoption rate and happened r rather quickly. And, you know, that's kind of built onto a lot of these other things that, that really kind of spearheaded those technologies going off into, into another segment. So are they recording? So if auto steer is there, it's just, it's using GPS and it's, what I've seen, it's like stupid accurate. Yeah. I mean, it's just, Sub -inch. yeah, I mean, it, it is ridiculously good. And so why do you, why would you want to do that for the people that understand, don't understand that? Part of it is repeat, repeatability. So we can come back to that exact same spot, every pass across the field. So you're actually um, getting more plants in the ground because you're, well, more it's, it's not about approved. It's, it's more about, um, being able to come back to that same spot so we plant we fertilize we spray we do all those kind of things that you know we can put stuff down to that exact plant level instead of you know say we're spraying something over here that doesn't need to be we oh i didn't even we know can, that we can shut that planter off as we come into what we call point rows and instead of planting you know all 16 rows out there and we're not gonna farm part of it just because of the way that the, the planter goes. Now we've got these auto shutoffs that you've got a boundary and it just boom, boom, boom. Is that work on so spraying for like fertilizer and, and all, Roundup all and all that? Yep. Really? And then, you know, so there's a seed savings piece there. You're, you know, we don't have these wide rows, narrow rows as, as, uh, as we used to whenever we were doing it all, you know, by hand, if you will. And so there's just a, there's some savings that are involved in that. And then, you know, as that technology has evolved, we've been able to collect that data every so many feet through the field Yeah, uh, to be able to come back to and, and look at that, you know, hey, why, why did this field do this? Well, you know, we had fewer plants here for whatever reason, and then that's where I get to come in and kind of investigate, you know, what's going on here. Is it a soil problem? Is it an equipment problem? Is it a, you know, rodent problem, you know, insects, Insect, whatever, yeah. whatever yeah. it may be. Yeah, that's, and that's, I forgot, and this is getting back to, because I don't play in the space as much as I did three to five years ago um, with ag guys as much, but we, we've, our practice has changed a little bit, but also we're so s piercing specific on trying to help guys on what they're trying to accomplish in finance that I've fallen down on what the trends are a little bit. Cause I used to know a lot more than what I did inside of there. <laughs> right. and, and especially with Dan and, and I love Dan to death and, and all of that. But uh, you know, he would always educate me. Well, there's this insect or this disease or whatever it is that, you know, y'all have y'all's ups and downs on that every single year where you got too much water and it, you get a fungus or you get a disease and then you have an insect problem, all this stuff. So you're being able to mitigate some of that using precision ag as well then, right? Yeah, to some degree, uh, the we work with the with the never changing variables. So yeah. your soul's not going to ever change unless right. you go out there with a D nine cat and tear something up. Uh, so that's we can start with that piece, um, and then we tie in you know in season stuff like the imagery, the drones. Um, weather forecasting has gotten way better than it ever was before. Mm. And so all of those things kind of couple together, kind of help you make those small adjustments in season um, where we can take care of a lot of the, you know, the stuff that we know is going to happen based on what soil types and just, you know, general trends as far as weather goes. We can take care of that on the on the front side and then tweak things as we keep come back going down the system. Yeah. Yeah. So where do you think the ag industry is going? Uh, I got a lot of opinion on this, so yeah, I'm, I'm going mean, to load I, you I up, could, man. I could take this <laughs> in a lot of different directions. I do know that there is a ton of consolidation going on in the um, in the farming sector. Just smaller guys are getting out, and bigger guys keep getting bigger, and and so there, there's um, you know that's going on pretty well across the the whole U.S. 
And and I feel like that's where you know as guys get bigger and bigger, they they don't have that personal touch on this on this ground. They don't you know they're taking over ground that they've never farmed before. So there's a lot of things that they don't know, and they just don't have the the manpower themselves to do it. So that's where people like us, uh, I feel like fit into that space to help fill those gaps. Again, going back to the data, you probably have the data in those fields. Yeah. You've got to go back to the data with, and if you don't have it, we can get it. Yeah. That's crazy. So So I I want to unpack that a little bit. I, and here's my deal is it, it scares me for my kids, this generation of where ag's going in the United States. And I I've said this on a couple of shows that we've had some, so we had a, a multi-billionaire. I mean, he owned, I can't remember how, how much did Rodney have? Probably over 150,000 acres. Something like yeah. So 150,000 acres in two or three different States. And, and this guy was, um, he, he, you need to watch that podcast if you get a chance. Cause he had Osper, he has Osperger's or no, he does not like that term. I forgot that. Forgive me. Yeah. He's on the spectrum a little bit and he's got like, I think 40 different financial designations. He's got two PhDs in finance. I mean, he's, that's his core job and he inherited all this land. And he said, Hey, Brandon, this is where the cost is getting where it's prohibited for small farmers or young farmers. And that's my problem is there's, I'm not seeing young farmers get in it. It it is a lot harder. The barrier to entry is now multi-million dollars. I mean, just around Baylor and Cotton now is what, eight, nine hundred thousand? It's a million bucks. It's a million bucks. That is insanity, right? And then you're getting the cost of seed. And I get it, the seed yields have gone up. But I mean, what was the cost of seed 25, 50 years ago before patents got into it? What, 35 bucks a bag? Oh, something like that? Yeah, something ridiculous. Low. And and now what is it now? Six hundred dollars a bag? Four to six hundred. That's insane. And, and there, there's good to that and there's bad to that. So I'd love for you to speak on what's good about that. And I'd love for you to say what's bad also, because there, there, it's a double-edged sword. Because in my perspective, as the cost goes up, even though the yield goes up and the re- return goes up, so does the risk if it doesn't work. And so I'm dealing with farmers in an aspect of not so much as retirement planning as I deal with ag producers and going, how do I hedge the risk? Right. Right. How do I, I become my own bank and start taking and paying down things and then using lines of credits of my own assets to be able to operate? And that's where a lot of conversations I have with that guys where I think uh, there's a lot of value there. And especially in today's terms, like, you know, two, three years ago, you couldn't really do it efficiently because you're looking at Fed fund rates of being 0.25. Right. Now you're looking at you can buy treasuries at, you know, four, five, six percent there's an arbitrage opportunity between taking your own capital and lending back to yourself instead of going to a bank. Right. Right. And being able to get almost as efficient as what a bank is. Uh, And and every scenario is different. So I can't promise this to anybody. Right. I'm just talking on a high level across the board. And uh, we talked about this before we got on air is, you know, corporate farming is now getting to, um, and I, I want you to define corporate farming because I think both of us have the same perspective of corporate farming, but I think the general people do not. So, yeah, there's there's really two aspects to corporate farming. One is somebody like Bill Gates or Ted Turner, or those, you know, these billionaires that are buying up land uh, everywhere that they can. And for, you know, I don't really know what the purpose of that is yet. Uh, I'm sure it will be, become apparent uh, somewhere down the line. But I do know that that from a Gates Foundation standpoint is that they are determining how that ground needs to be farmed. Horribly uh, in, bad, in, by in, the way. In, There's in a lot of stories about how bad they're doing on yes, it. Yes, uh, and that typically happens with with larger uh, corporations getting involved with things. And then you know the other aspect of that is is just a family that has set up a corporation to farm with, and and they still farm quite a few acres, but that was. It's still a family a, operation. Yeah, they just insulated for, themselves in corporate for yeah. tax benefits or operating benefits, right? Right. And so that's where I think everybody says corporate farming. You're just like, shunned on. like I'm a corporate farmer because I have a corporation. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a publicly traded or a billionaire going and buying up, you know, two, three, four, five hundred thousand acres, which is going on. Yep. And, and so we got to be real cognitive of that. So whenever I, I'm always looking for my favorite part of my job is to make sure I continue Continue the family legacy in one aspect or another. And if you look at most families, there's always not, I would say nine times out of 10, there's 
a kid that is farming and there might be one or two that isn't. Does that make sense? Yep. And so how do we equalize the state? How would, how do we allow the one kid that is farming the opportunity not to hinder himself because the margins are so thin and the cost of capital is so high and the risk is so high and the other two, Sometimes, you know, the daughter that's a doctor or the CPA out there that, you know, he's just the family wants to equalize the state. But if they go out and take a loan, then it puts more stress on it. Or if they're sharing dividends at the end of the year and the, the new upcoming 25 to 35 year old farmer is going, hey, I don't, I don't want to take dividends. I want to roll this back into my next year's right. crop to keep expanding my operations here. And so there's a conflict that happens between the active secession farmer the son or typically right i'm not saying it's always got to be a son there's some, i found one or two little daughters there's out there that there, there's around. a few coming up right and so but then there's a lot of them that aren't you know that they went into a different industry and how to equalize that estate and i found it's never there's not a silver bullet to do no. it either no and and uh, are you seeing that yes and i don't remember who it was but i had a i had a farmer one time tell me you know, he kind of had that same situation with his kids and, you know, one of them was putting in all the work. Yep. But they were trying to equal share everything. Does not work. And, you know, the one that was putting in all the work was, was not overly happy about having to share, you know, his lifeblood with the two over here that were, you know, in town making bukus of money. Yeah. Because the sweat equity, in uh, there. you know, unless they were able to, to provide some level of, you know, value to the operation into the yeah. operation and, and and there is opportunities for that if it's set up and structured right you know maybe you got somebody over here that's you know very business savvy and they they can help this guy do better mm -hmm. marketing and and this kind of stuff so there's no one size fits all no you got to define what one. marketing is because yeah. marketing in y'all's world does not mean like marketing on youtube in the, selling our product yes yeah, selling price. the yeah selling the actual commodity of the grains and stuff like that so here's how i approach it right equal is not fair fair is not equal but if you look at it from a 5 10 15 year time horizon so if you're in your late 50s and you got kids that you think might want to participate in the operation start then so you can leak out 1% of your net worth and protect the other 99% and actually give massive value to the next generation. It's the Rockefeller effect. That's yeah. why they're nine generations in, right? And so you can set this thing up where it actually does really good tax benefit from a tax benefit from also from a legacy and a trust and a structure benefit to make all this thing work really really well nine times out of ten but start when you're young the ones that are really hard to do are the ones that are in their 70s or 80s and they're like we got to fix this quick because you know somebody's in a pass and we're going to lose some opportunities and then there becomes this conflict in the family and makes thanksgiving really really difficult <laughs> at times well and, and i do see that trend and i'll probably step on some toes by saying this but uh a lot of these people that have been in this business for a long time and they're in their 60s 70s they've never relinquished control they've never allowed that conversation to happen to move people in mm -hmm. and then whenever they decide to leave they just kind of turn it over and here's a 50 year old guy out here trying to do what he's supposed to do. And he has no idea how it's supposed to work. Cause he they, didn't know was, every aspect of the business. Yeah. There was, the, he wasn't involved in most of those decisions and that's, that's a travesty. It is. It is. And that's, that's the hard part is that, so I'm a huge advocate out. I, I do it at huge discounts just to make sure that if, if you're in your thirties and forties and you're, entering the business i'm going to help you out a little a little extra i do it to all of my clients but a little extra just to make sure that i want you to be successful and i'm being selfish on that i want to make sure my kids have the opportunity to you know get good food and and we don't have everything that is manipulated yeah there's there's quite a bit of manipulation of the food supply that is beyond our eyeballs Really, and but I don't I don't know enough about it to, to speak about it because I'm learning it just like you are. But uh, it's it's a scary proposition, and and it, it's really strange because I uh, my wife was having some gastrointestinal issues, and we went overseas for a wedding and stayed there for a week, it's and gone. she had no issues over there. And we then we come back and and the same problem. And so. You know, everybody wants to say it's gluten or it's GMOs or it's this and that, but there's there's a lot more 
happening than than those things. I agree with you. We went to South America for a mission trip, and I, I was really worried about that. And I typically have, you know, where I just all of a sudden just don't feel well, right? And I went to South America. I ate for three days, and I've never felt that good. And it's crazy. And I was like, this is insanity. And I come back to the States and we, we have an issue with our food supply. There's not a question with it. How that is happening, I have no idea for such a wealthy country that we're in. Um, it's a little bit disturbing in a lot of aspects of it. Well, and, and the biggest problem that's happened is that we have separated the you know, production and from the consumption. Mm. And you know we've got to get things spread out a lot further than it used to be. You can't just go down to the market and pick up fresh produce and these things, you know, during certain times of year. And so, it, you know, and that's part of this corporatization of, of agriculture kind of plays into this. And so it's, you know, I don't know, you know, the best way to do that is to bring it back local, but I don't think we could ever get back to that. hundred percent. Well, I mean, you, you're too urbanized and right in the East and West coast side. So. I'm just worried I mean, I about live, West I Texas. live in the middle. Yeah, so. I know. That's what I'm saying about <laughs> those guys have kind of uh, put themselves in that own position there. But, hey, so talking about living in the middle, what is West Texas doing in, in the ag industry? What Like get a little more regional here, a little more local. So what are you seeing on a local level? Are yields going up? Is is I mean, I see, and I will tell you this, like we, I've been in a three-hour meeting today where we talked about where we're at from an economic standpoint, and we're fixing to see a, a very severe recession. And uh, whenever the twos and tens invert inside the yield and you're seeing yield spreads widen, and there's a whole lot of data that's coming off of this. But now you just saw the, the fallout this week, right, of oil that is really taking a hit and that usually comes at the tail end of it but what follows is you're going to get a spike in oil and guess what follows right behind that is commodity prices yep. right and so last year and this year we've seen orange juice up two three hundred percent are you seeing that are y'all preparing for you know if yields rise if the cost rises to implement that the price is going to have to go and do we see that catastrophic the hard part I see is when everything goes up, everybody's like, yeah, it's going up, it's going up, but the input costs go up with it, right? And then all of a sudden the price craters when you're in the back half of that recession, but yet the cost has not come down quick enough, and now you're stuck with you planted something in the field that costs you twice as much as what it's going to yield in return. And that's when it's going to put a lot of these ag producers out of business. And so I'm seeing ag producers going out, but speak on a local regional level. Are, are, are you seeing yields go up a, along with prices or where are we at? Weather is, is the biggest factor on that. So whenever we have good weather, yes, we ha have seen improvements in, in yield and you know products that have handled um our neck of the woods really well whenever the weather doesn't cooperate like this year um you know we've got guys producing 25 to 50 percent less than they did with reasonably high inputs mm -hmm. that don't look like they're going to get any better and looking into at least the first quarter of next year uh commodity prices are are dropping and you know i think there's a lot of things that are happening outside of our control from a um, you know, geopolitical s level. Yeah. You know, uh, of course, inflation and, and things like that, people are going to buy food over, over clothes. Sure. So, you know, our cotton price is kind of stagnated, but even our, our grain prices are dropping down and they typically do this time of year just because of the Midwest harvest. But uh, allegedly they didn't have the crop that they normally have. So I would, I'm, I'm a little surprised that it's dropped where it, where it is. And so, uh, you know, I think the practices and the, you know, the genetics and the, you know, some of the things that we're utilizing out here, we have improved the yield, um, but we still can't really 100% offset, you know, a drought. No, you can't. So, I mean, that that's a hard part. And what's so it's Texas... hard, to, hard to judge. Well, what, what kind of progress have we made? Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny. We came out with a, a drought tolerant corn back in 2011. And, uh, and we're still marketing, you know, through that at, at this level, but in 11 and even in a couple of other pretty bad years after that, that corn still died, but it lasted another two weeks. So are we making improvement? Yes. And if we would have caught a rain in there, would it, you know, 
shot for the moon. But uh, if we can make it rain out here, that would be a lot better. Yeah. So so explain that. So, well, I don't. I just think we need to disclose the fact that we're in a desert where we live. West Texas, I mean, is it's I think what's it, 16, 17 inches a year that we get here in West Texas? 18. Is 18? For here in Lubbock, and about uh, 12 inches of that comes on average between May 1st and September 15th. Really? And so, so what do you need to grow a good corn crop? We, we can do it on that, but it needs to do that. But you got to do it right in the time where the the crop needs the water the most because uh-huh. i mean there's a lot of guys i've seen it, it's funny it's uh, what's there's a running joke and it's been around forever or it's like you know when you get the rain when you don't get the rain uh, farmers always complain oh yeah they're never happy on either side <laughs> yeah they're never happy on either side of it and, uh, it, it was ended up being a dirty joke but i'll let i'll leave it there but <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it usually rains at planting and at harvest and it won't do anything in between yeah and right so, you know that's what's crazy this year i don't know how much rain we had back in in may but it was whatever 10 or 12 inches had another 10 inches here in whatever late september early october so uh, for the year it's going to look like we had a great year but it came in those two time frames that were probably as bad as could be if it had been a month earlier on both sides it would have been a great we'd have a different conversation yeah because we always need it in july and it never seems like it rains in july yeah we we don't typically but if we if we catch something in first of august that that goes a long ways really the uh so explain so in your mind you work with how many producers you you got to work with 100 producers or so yeah we're you know probably we actively work with probably 75 80 and then you know have some others that just do pieces of stuff probably you know 40 or 50 of those and then I've got a bunch more I'd like to work with. So of course uh, me too right everybody <laughs> in business you're not in business if you don't but Explain what it costs to operate a farm. Like, let's break that down for two seconds so we can kind of on the finance side. So a lot of people don't understand that you got to pay for the dirt. So you're there, you bought it and you got typically a mortgage. And I'm not talking about the 70 year old guy that's already paid that thing off and he's had it for 35 years. I'm talking about the average person right now has got a mortgage on that dirt. Then you got to turn around and pay for the seed. Then you got to pay for the input costs, which is the water, the electricity, the fertilizer, all the stuff that goes into it. Then you got the harvest costs Mm -hmm. and you got the machinery to all do that. Then you got labor on top of that. So, I mean, like who in the heck wants to farm? It's a, there's a reason why I'm not doing it. Yeah. (laughs) There's a lot of risk to to get started. Yeah. It's, it takes a lot of capital to get into it, but not only that, it's a lot of risk. The funny thing is, is the really, really, really good farmers I've seen, most of them have their land paid off. You can't have all three metrics is what I've seen. So you can't have, you know, cost on the land. You can't have cost on your equipment and then you can't have a lot of cost in your overhead. And if, if you have one of those things paid off, you're, you're pretty level inside right. of there. Now, the ones that are kind of what we'd consider wildcatting in the oil industry are the dry, dry land farmers, which is becoming more and more in today's society around here because, again, there's not a whole lot of water. And so you're hoping for a good rain in, in the right time. But there is some pockets of water around West Texas where – you know that rain is a l- little less concerning because you can pump it and you got nice little drip or you got irrigated water around West Texas that you know you can you can make a crop pretty consistently. For the most part, it's uh, it number one, it's an, a much increased uh, cost because uh, it will be as much as as your seed. Really, I didn't know that. Sandwich. Yeah, what makes it or, more or expensive? Even more. It just costs a lot of money to pump water out of the ground. Yeah, like, so the electricity costs. Electricity or natural gas, yes, or whatever yep, your, yep. whatever you. Are you seeing solar coming in that? Or no, wind? not a uh, not reliable enough. Really, so yeah, I was wondering if that was ever take over. You know, we're running ninety days, twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah, so there's no way to put solar. On top of these pivots, uh, just nobody's to cut figured it out yet. Really? Have they tried? I don't think very hard. I mean, we, there are some solar wells that we're using in uh, like the livestock industry out in pastures and whatnot. Well, where you're pumping a little bit. Yeah, uh, but these are these are small wells. These are not three, four, five hundred gallon wells, which there isn't that many of those <laughs> left. But <laughs> you're in high cotton if yeah, you are. I got you know got a lot of guys that you know are pumping have, three wells have, together just uh, to make a half circle or, or ten or twelve <laughs> at, 
at 50 gallons a piece. So. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, that's that's crazy inside of there. So what do you think the average cost when you break all these things down? What's 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 an acre of land or a section of land? What do you think that's going to cost to run somebody? And what's the margins today to operate? Oh, you put me on spot here. I know, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I know we've, we've run some, you know, some projections on some uh, crop budgets and stuff like that. And they're, you know... Eight nine hundred bucks an acre to grow a grow a crop, and hopefully you're going to gross out. I think know, it, yeah, th thirteen fourteen hundred. Yeah, see that I, that's right. I, we were at seven fifty eight hundred dollars is what you're planning on, and you're lucky if you're getting twelve fourteen hundred dollars an acre. That's that's the problem, and and you can go broke faster than than anything. Whenever you're trying to go for a three bell cotton crop, and you're only making two. Mm. Yeah, that's, it that's goes tough. south in a hurry. And I think uh, with all the precision stuff that's going on, and, and everybody loves the green and red steel. That and I will talk to everybody and tell them blue in the face, and that's the first thing they do. They're like, and I hate it. This is one of the biggest things I have. Stop doing this if you're an ag producer, please. And I will argue and tell them blue in the face. If you have a great crop year and you made some money, do not unless you absolutely have absolutely have to have the equipment run out there and go buy a new piece of equipment that has been the, the the trend for the last 25 30 years and i'm not saying that you need a piece of equipment to to hey if i get this piece of equipment my yields go up or i get to buy this piece of, or i get to uh what do you call it uh where you're you're uh harvesting for somebody else uh, custom, harvesting. custom harvesting yeah all that stuff's a business decision i'm talking about the guy like hey i'm either going to roll my crop or i'm going to you know take insurance late or i'm going to buy a piece of equipment just to roll my income and I think that rolling of an income is is something that you're just trying to play a game with the IRS. And a lot of ag producers just don't want to pay $1 to the IRS. And I get it, right? I, no, none of us do. But nobody does, right? I'm also glad that I get to do that because that means I did all right. Yeah, you made a little bit of money. But there's like 20 other strategies out there where you buy appreciated assets or you keep your assets protected and you don't have to actually buy something that's depreciating. It never made sense to me. So if I if I buy a million dollar piece of equipment, what do you think that equipment's worth the following year? Seven hundred, eight hundred grand. Yeah. So you're getting a, a fifteen to thirty percent, you know, de depletion or uh, write off in that equipment. I get it, but that value that value is going right out the window with you. So you might as well just pay the taxes. It's it's on par with the tax cost in, in some circumstances, not all. So there's a lot of conversations that I have with ag producers that says, hey, do you really need that 13 or, or, or you know, fifth different round baler? Can you get it done with four? Can you get it done with 12? And, you know, there's some guys out there that have some equipment i mean there's there, you know but they're also farming 150,000 acres or 80,000 well, acres gotta, you got to be smart with that one of the best things that i've ever seen in that same scenario was instead of a guy going and buying his equipment he went and bought compost and put it across his whole farm mm. and that paid him benefits for three years after after that just taking care of the soil yeah you know proper fertility balancing things out organic matter all those th things work together yeah. And uh, so, it, do you think there's enough time that w that has been spent today? Because I always wonder this: you can't f keep farming that same piece of land year in and year out, and not be pulling all those nutrients out without going back and actually redoing that. And I get it; we put fertilizer in it, we put nitrogen in it, back in it, and they do it every single year. But is there something on a long term plan that they're going to need to do that is kind of more of an organic side of instead of because corn's the worst from what I hear. The nitrogen amount. Amount of nitrogen you got to put on the on, on the crop is a lot, isn't it? It's it's a fair amount, yeah. And so, is there anything else that like compost that they can do to actually get oh, you yeah. better yields and oh, reduces yeah. that input cost? There, you know, there there's lots of different strategies, and this soil health movement is has bring has brought a lot of this to light. Um, I don't think that we're ever going to truly deplete ourselves of of nutrients in the soil, but we've got to break loose the ones that are there you know, because they're, they're tied up, they're locked up. And so roots, microbes, those kind of things are where, where that's going to have to happen. And, and the guys that have been following those practices for the last you know decade are starting to see the benefits in input reductions, uh, yield stability, you know, all these kind of things uh, that are going to make a, a producer, you know, successful. Yeah. So if somebody wanted to, to reach out to you and go, hey, like, what do you do that's different than what, like, 
So I'm the dumb idiot that's over here that's in finance. That's, that's nothing to do it. But if you're a 30, 40, 50 year old guy and you're you're taking over grandpa's farm and you're doing all these things, what what value are you bringing to? Hey, let's evaluate what's going on to get better yields, the offset costs, to get more efficient. Probably the best way to put that is go back to that money ball um, example in just that we're able to collect the data, analyze it, and interpret it and put it into actionable items for for you as a producer. And, and we're not, I'm not a, you know, computer data nerd sitting over here. I, I'm, I like to uh, play in the dirt all day and, and crunch the numbers at night. That's kind of how I like to. And like your to background, you got, you got a master's, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And crop physiology. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's not like you're not the, don't know what you're doing inside of there, Jeff, right? No, it's uh, I mean, that's, that's what we, we get off on. This is, this is where I feel like my place in the world is, is to, if I can't farm it myself, I'm going to go work with, with growers to grow the best crop that they possibly can. So what do you think the yields is by working with you compared to work not working with you? Is, oh, is that what you look at? It What's that metrics? Because we have metrics. It's more on that uh, that return on investment. So, yeah, the ROI. Because, it, you know, some years it, it is going to be a yield increase. Other years it's going to be a, you know, a input decrease. And some years it's going to be both. But, you know, I would say somewhere in that 15 to 20 percent range on on either side of that uh, equation is, is what we're looking at. So you're saying that you get a 100 percent return over five years. That is an incredible opportunity there. And, and why, why isn't everybody doing this? Just because they the old, the old trend. always, you know, the we've always way. done it the, the other way, which is our biggest competitor. It's not, you know, it's not Joe Blow down the street. That's my competitor. It's that we've always done it this way. Yeah, I could see that. Just changing people's and, mind to see there's another way to do it. You know, having conversations recently with with a uh, young producer that's taken over for, from his dad, and uh, it's been refreshing. I enjoy working with either one of them, but for the uh, the young guy coming in, you know, now that dad has has totally stepped aside, he's he's looking at at things from a different lens and uh already opened up to you know starting to understand why is why is this farm only producing this and this one over here is doing that and parts of the field are are doing these things and so you know we've got a plan as soon as harvest is over to start uh start uncovering you know what's going on out there and putting a plan to get there are you seeing that a lot more where uh, the, the farmer the, the ag producer himself is starting to plan earlier and starting to actually look at the data a little bit more so they know hey this year you know the crop's not set up as far as marketing their crop to hey i want to lower costs this year i feel like hey you know margins are tighter we don't have the weather we had a bad crop year are you able to help in that data analysis on your side of it to say hey this year let's go to a lower cost crop just to make sure that we don't unwind progress is that kind of one of the analysis I, I, that you do yes i'm able to do that but the process has not done that as a whole so farmers are not making decisions any earlier at least the ones that we're working with which is truly frustrating on my mind because uh you know you call them this time of year trying to get seed selections put in place and they're like well heck i didn't even finish this crop how do you know what we need to do well we spent a lot of time over the last several years not just this growing season understanding where these products need to be placed how they need to be placed and we can always make tweaks but that planning process probably needs to start six to nine months before the next cropping season to truly mm. get everything put in place then that gives you the ability to start um you know pricing some of these different inputs and and you know truly putting together a, a real strategy that we can that we can put in play and you know, there's a couple of guys that are starting to get on that on that track, but as a general rule, most guys want to get through harvest, get it done, and then they'll start focusing. Yeah, on, then they'll yeah, start focusing. Bird in the on hand, them, so. right now they're trying to focus on what's in front of them instead of planning on what's ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I could see that. We we fought that in in financial planning. We fought that, in, I think, in every business. It's very hard unless you get on a rhythm. It's like a dance, right? You get on that constant engagement of what's coming down the pipeline to help them maximize whatever they're trying to accomplish. And a lot of people are so tunnel vision into what's in front of them, they can't look past. Hey, yeah, I got to do this first before I can do this. Yeah, you can do both. 
right? You you can spend 1% of your time to look a year down the road to make sure you're not unwinding, unwinding progress. And, and that's a hard thing to do because people don't have that vision side. And so gleaning into that is, is I've had to do things like this, like just sit down and have a conversation with a guy that's in a different industry than me, just to have them go, Hey, this is kind of interesting. And I never thought about that. And then they start thinking about it. And then guess what happens? They pick up a phone, have a conversation with you. Right. And they're like, Hey, you know what? You're right. After listening to this, it was just in a different environment that I needed to hear it where it wasn't directed. And it's funny. Like if somebody looks at it from outside their own perspective, there's more weight to it for some reason. Mm-hmm. So us having a conversation here about what's going on, but if I was talking to a client about their own finances, then it always is a pers- perspective of what are you trying to gain off of it? It's a relationship of back and forth, but when they glean at it from a third party side, they get to apply it to their own situation. And I think that's what you're trying to accomplish in a lot of things doing. Do y'all share data on like, we talked about this, like co-ops. I think co-ops are a really great thing for the ag industry, but do y'all come in there and have like these, Hey, events like we just came back from a tax institute. We're fixing to go to another one in San Diego at at the I think it's in March, which is the worst time for us to go. But anyways, do y'all have those where you're coming in? I know, you know, Brant Ball was a a good friend of mine. I was a neighbor. You know, he was uh, had a master's in agronomy. I think his is in agronomy, was it? And so, and he was kind of in your industry there a long time ago. I don't know what he's doing now. I don't really know either. It, I think he's on the seed side too, isn't he? I, I know he's working for I one haven't of seen them. him in a, quite a while, but he's, uh, but anyways, I learned that, you know, independent pest management association is actually ran on a county level and it was ran by West, uh, A&M, right? Mm-hmm. Is it still yeah, ran by A&M? Service, yep. Yeah. So, and do you associate where you're kind of coming in and you're educating on that level on what, on a, on a local, Hey, this is what plain view is doing. This is because all that changes. You go 50 miles in any direction, 30 miles in most cases, really there, yeah. there's a huge, like, because what's the cutoff? Like it took me forever to learn what the cutoff in planning from plain view to La Mesa is mm-hmm. like, could be a whole month. month. There, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of difference in that. Yeah. So you got a lot of microclimates out here, but, um, as far as, data sharing it it depends on how you look at that i mean yes we've got crop consultant um, associations that i'm part of that you know we get together a couple times a year and go over stuff you know there's several of those type of uh, organizations uh don't necessarily share a particular grower's data with nah, anybody it's too, else it's yeah too that's and, and that's uh personal it's too one specific right but i was more like a you know here's what Plainview's doing here's what right. Lubbock's doing Regional no uh, or yeah you know and, and I, I i cover a pretty wide swath mm-hmm. from perryton texas down to big spring and from clovis to altus so that's uh, like a state <laughs> <laughs> there are states smaller than that yeah so it's uh but it, it gives me great perspective to see things that are working and not working and sure. being able to share that around uh, also being able to try things in different environments that, you know, to see where, you know, how is, how is this practice going to work versus something else? And, and then being able to bring those guys in, we try to have a couple of meetings a year where we, you know, it's open to everybody. Unfortunately, not everybody shows up, but, uh, where we, we try to get everybody together, educate them on some things that we're seeing trends, get them thinking about the future. And, and the biggest value of that is having other growers bouncing ideas around each other. Um, just, whether it be on hey what works here what works work for yeah. me it's you know having them tell themselves yeah. and their own perspective of it and I think that's really cool the opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual to determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a decision Man, so it's uh, good to jump back on real quick here. I, I think your glass got a little different color in it. So, you know, it's going to make this flow a little bit easier, isn't it? Yeah, I got a tan. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, th- let's dive back into, uh, we were talking when we were offline here a little bit on commodity prices. You think they're going to move or you think they're going to go down or be stagnant? Because we're looking at, at a very major concern in the global economic markets into the level of like 2001, 2007 area. And and I think commodity, especially oil and gas, is really going to, you saw that major decline over the last week, two weeks here. 
is uh, one of the sharpest pullbacks we've seen in the last couple of years. It's just the onset of fix and be a bull rally as we get to the start of a true recession. Um, but what do you think if oil does rally like that, what do you think commodities are going to do? Because it all kind of drives from oil, then it drives from cattle. And then, cause I was under the impression that you're going to see commodity prices and especially the grains go up and then cattle prices are going to go up. You're, you're seeing a more stable out, outcome as you know, cattle's got to go up before commodities. Well, I would, it. yeah, I would prefer it to be that way just cause it's a little more organic, uh, move, at least from my perspective. Because it seems like whenever the grains move too quickly up, um, then at some point, you know, cattle guys are going to say, well, we, we can't afford this. We're going to switch, you know, s- switch sources of feed, you know, back to wheat or, you know, whatever it may be. So, Grass, yeah. Um, so, that, you know, if, if the cattle can come up and then the, the grains can move along with it, you know, I think that's a little more er- organic, stabilized uh, movement in the market. And, and I, you know, there's there's room for it it's just what are those outside factors outside of the u.s why are they you know what are they doing to hold us back at this point so is china still affecting it and like i don't like the way the way the usda grades our cotton compared to what china doesn't grade aren't we the only country that actually grades our cotton and nobody else does uh to the level that we that we do yeah yeah, isn't that kind of a disservice to a certain degree? Because everybody's, we're quoting on like a premium grade where the you know the mic isn't that the mic is a little bit thicker and it's longer strands and all those things come into the way that they're grading. But yet they're saying in China or these other countries that's the same quality and it ends up not being. So it's like they're pushing on a less quality onto the market at the same price, and so it devalues our our. Well, it's like anything. They're they're going to go buy the as much of the cheapest thing that they can get by with mm-hmm. and then fill in the gaps with with the good quality stuff and so uh, you know i don't i don't know i don't trust china at all on anything that they got to say about what they what they want what their they inventories need. Yeah. and what they have yeah because yeah. they're always wrong and, wrong uh, intentionally it's most of the time <laughs> it well, seems like it, you know it, and i feel like the usda is is wrong quite a bit too and i don't want to think that that's intentional just they're not very good at it, but, uh, my question with that, and here's, here's where I, I think, you know, healthy tension to that is how in the world can we have precision ag down to the inch, but yet the USDA cannot actually count how many acres of corn, you know, how many acres we have planted, like literally there's satellite. It's not that hard. Yeah. It, that's where I think they, they, they know it's just other people manipulating this thing. I get a kick out of working with these growers and they don't want to share their data and, and I get it. I mean, I'm a, That's their blood, I'm, a, tears. I'm a private yeah. person yeah. too. I don't, I don't just give my phone number out to everybody, but, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give it out. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> as far as, you know, that data, most, most of the things that they would be sharing are, are out there. Somebody's already looking anyway. So it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a moot point in, in the end, but, uh, but it is really cool. Some of the things that we've, we've learned to do with, with the guys that have shared some data with us. And one in particular is we've been able to collect irrigation data on what it took to produce a crop. Mm. Well, we've got our test plots in there, different hybrids, and we've been able to dial in, okay, it's going to take this many inches or this many bushels per inch of water for that hybrid to, you know, to perform. And, and this one's going to be a little bit different. That one's going to be a little bit different. So it's really helped us when a guy comes in and says, "Hey, I've you know I've got a 300 gallon pit. What what can I grow on it?" Well, I can go take a look at that data and say, "Well, are you giving that back to the seed companies? Or are y'all keeping that as proprietary?" That, that I would keep that as proprietary. Well, that is proprietary to our yeah, seed company that we partner with. Okay. And so, and everything's shared because uh, you know permissions and all that kind of stuff and and uh but n- you know none of the individual data is shared it's all aggregated together and and uh sure sure so, you're, you're you know, getting an anonymous. overall average yeah. inside of it but to... it, it's really it's really starting to to show up with what we can do with that information same with you know what seeding rate does it need to be how much nitrogen does this need to have versus another one so that's that's where this thing is is going to um in the future for the people that participate 
Yeah. So I'm going to go back and forth with you a little bit. So let, let's assume like two different scenarios, right? So let's assume you're the 30, 20, 30 year old and you're starting out in the business, right? What would you tell them that they need to actually, Hey, here's, here's a couple of keys that you need to focus on to make sure you're successful. How would you break that down to somebody that's young in the, in the industry? And then let's do it again on the guys that are in their 50s, 60s and 70s that are thinking about exiting. I think one of the biggest things is, is build a network of trusted advisors around you as a, as a new producer. And it, you know, it's going to take some culling, uh, you know, over the years to, to, you know, find the ones that have the right intentions, but to, ha to have people that you can bounce things back and forth with, um, you know, even a network of other growers that may not even be in your direct area, I think is very beneficial. And then having the people that, uh, that support those those growers around, whether it be consultants, you know, suppliers, all these kind of things. But but get some people that you trust to be honest with you, mm -hmm. and not just you know we're not just out here trying to sell you something. Is is one of the key things. Um, you know, part of another aspect of that is just to be smart with with that you know with that money. Um, in many cases, from an in point, input standpoint, you know, I want to. You know, I don't even want to look at something unless it's going to give me a three X return. Sure. And so, you know, having some true insight on how that needs to look on on your operation, because there's a lot of these things that we trade dollars back and forth that, you know, you just wasted your time. Yeah, time, energy, everything, yeah. and capital typically. Yeah. I look at that d two different ways, and I think having the trusted advisors, I always say that. I'm, I've been on multiple podcasts saying that, that you really have to have advisors you get along with that can be honest with you and be truthful, and you, you understand their intent of what they're trying to communicate to you because there's a line share of people out there that are doing it for the right reason, and they want to communicate to you. It's just as if it's a good fit, and, and they're communicating the right things for your situation in there. And we always try to do that, but it's a hit and miss, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're 90%. I always say if you're 90% communicating the right thing to the right person, and sometimes it's about interpret interpretation, and some, sometimes it's about just being able to connect with somebody on the level where they feel that trust can be forged and be created and, and, and long-term relationships can happen. The other side of that is I really think that people don't know where they're trying to accomplish, don't know where they're going. It's it's uh, Nobody knows how to set goals. Yeah, no. It, and realistic it, ones at that. Yeah, and so I think everybody can always over overestimates what they can do in a young, one year, and they dramatically underestimate what they can do in three to five years. And there's, there, again, books are written on this. And so I would always look at it like, hey, if I'm going to get in the business of any business, like there's probably on a monthly basis now, I'm evaluating multiple, probably three businesses. I think we're up to our CFAs or at least doing three, maybe four. And we're always looking at how do we automate this? How do we make streamline this? Because we look at businesses and we're like, wow, this is amazing. And then we look at businesses and we're like, wow, I wouldn't touch this with the 10 foot pole. <laughs> right. And so I think there needs to be, and we're working with FinTech software now where we're building our own stuff, but there needs to be, as you've seen in precision ag, there's going to be precision FinTech in y'all's industry coming where, and we're we're hopefully helping build that. We did it for uh, the the cattle market. Hey, where can we build the blueprint for people to input their data of what they're at, what they think is going to happen on that crop and that farm and that acreage and all that stuff, and and figure out what that one year, three year, five year, ten year, fifty year plan is. And I think that's where a lot of young guys need to start looking at because it's really a data driven society that we're in. And if you can't project those yields out, then there's a high probability then you're going to fail on it. And failing's not a bad thing. I'm just saying that it could. We learn a lot more from failing than we ever do from success. succeeding. Yeah. yeah. But, but if you can sidestep some of that, then your family might be in a better position long term. So that's, that's the one thing is, is look for that plan early on. And I know 20 year olds, I mean, you're 20 once too, I'm sure. Right. <laughs> and strap on your boots and let's go. Yep, yep. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And let's figure it out. Let's go. But sometimes it's like, hey, what's what's the stigma is about the bull up on the hill with the old bull and the young bull? <laughs> Let's run down there, you know. Yep, run down there, fight, and that's the old one that's still standing there. <laughs> well, that let's run down. There. <laughs> There's another joke to there that, is, Jeff. There is. 
there is. <laughs> Let's talk real quick um, and about the the old timer, right? So if you're 60 and over, what would you do differently than the 30 to 50 year old? You know, risk is not there. I've paid off my land. I'm, I'm looking at selling to the next generation or I'm doing a cash lease or, or crop share. You know, are you changing the strategy a little bit and preparing the next generation? Are you changing the strategy a little bit and trying to connect with the guy that's fixing to be the full time operator? With with how we work with those guys, you know, you, you've got to know that they're not going to change a whole lot. So it's it's about getting them to the finish line with enough money in their pocket to, to be comfortable, but also trying to just open their their minds to s- some new things that have come around over the last several years. And here's some growers in the area that are implementing it because one of those guys may be farming that ground yeah. in, the, in the future. And so kind of a, you know, a soft... Um, Hey, here's what's changing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Here's what's changing, but here's also some other connections you need to pay attention to. You know, and and they're very aware of what's going on around them and, you know, the guys that are doing good and the guys that aren't. But, but you know, just kind of help make that connection a little bit. And here's why they're doing that because, you know, I get a lot of them, man, those guys are crazy as can be. (laughs) Uh, I would have never done it that way. Right. Uh, Or in in a lot of cases, uh, some of the the practices that have come around, especially on some of this cover crop, and you're like, well, heck, I did that you know, 50 years ago. So explain what crop, cover crop is real quick so before we move off. So what a, what a cover crop, uh, we're utilizing it for, you know, to help reduce soil erosion, help build up the soil bus compaction, build nutrients, and basically give the, uh, the microflora that's naturally in the ground something to eat. And whenever that happens, then they break loose nutrients, they open up that ground, they do, uh, you know, so many good benefits, uh, kind of like a probiotic, you know, that you would take, uh, from a dietary standpoint. All right. Give and a so, practical example of that. And so basically what we'll do is, um, you know, let's just say you, you had a wheat crop that you harvested. We recommend coming in with a multi-species cover crop. So it would have something like sorghum, millet, uh, sun hemp, winter or peas, uh, sunflowers, radishes, you know, just a, a whole smorgasbord of, of uh, species and, and they all act differently. They all play off of each other. Let that grow, um, let it winter kill and then come and plant your crop into it next year. But are you harvesting anything off the plant now? No, I mean, I do have some guys that graze it Okay, and, and we're seeing exceptional, uh, you know, gains on cattle. That are so it's not that. a complete loss then? No. It, it doesn't have to be, and it's it's not a loss either, because of the benefits that you're going to get on the backside, you're you're going to have less weed issues. You're going to have better water infiltration. You're going to have some nutrients there that are available that weren't before, and you're not going to have to go out and sand fight because the you know the place is covered. And That's it, the big and, and and really well one of the biggest things for that me is, because I live in West Texas. Yeah. I'm tired of sandstorms. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but part of it is just sunscreen for that ground. Yeah. It's amazing. You go out there and test uh, bare soil in, in the middle of the summer, and it'll be 130 degrees. Well, life stops at that point. Whenever we have a cover crop, it may be, you know, on a 105-degree day, it may be 92. I did not understand that so, until you just said that. So I did not know that that actually affects the soil. So you're saying that actually doing a cover crop, <laughs> by definition. <laughs> so I thought cover crop meant that you're covering it because I've always seen it where the cover crop is up and you're you're growing your other crop up through that. So it provided shade so you could get it out before it's sandblasted, things like that. But you're saying cover crop is actually just totally taking temperature, soil temperature down. Mm-hmm. Am I totally off in what I was thinking though? Because I see um, a lot of these crops that are growing so what, things. Something. What you're uh, what you're referring to is is uh, like leaving stubble out there, yeah, and it, it achieves some of that, but all that stubble is dead. So there's it's not feeding very many microbes. Um, in many cases, it's standing up, so we're still getting sunlight to the ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, versus this other where you've got multi species in there. Of course, they're doing all kinds of different things, but you really have an in entanglement and you've shade the ground much better so why isn't guys i mean that, that's good vegetation so why there's are a, you not putting cattle on that or well, sheep or there's guys that that uh that farm and there's guys that raise livestock and very few of them are good at both 
So reach out to Jeff if if you want some guys. I got a ton of guys that are actively looking for their cattlemen, and they're actively looking for ground to put cattle on. And so if you're growing a good cover crop and you're not using it, reach out to Jeff. Jeff's like, I hate you, Brandon. No, I, I mean, that's a great idea to be able to connect – but, but it's got to be significant, right? These guys are looking for sections. They're not looking for, you know, you got to. We're, we're still dabbling a lot in this, but there's there's guys starting to take off and, and uh, really buy into to what these things can do. And, and like I said, it doesn't happen overnight. You're right. But if you can get into a program. Uh, a co-op almost year, between a cattleman and a, and a farmer and said, hey, I got 20 sections over here. Cool. Let's go. Let's go dump it on there. Yeah. Let's go. Dump. Yeah. Stuff like that, especially on a local level. Let's 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 figure out a way to get that done. So you gave your side on the older guys. I got to give mine because this is where I have a lot of fun. All right. And so the fun for me is and it really is me. And I have a pair of planter that the CFP back there is we get to dissect a family unit and we get to go, OK, what are you trying to accomplish? And 90% of these guys that are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, they're like, Brandon, I just, I love what I do, man. I just love growing a crop. I don't care. Like, everything's paid off. Like, I'm good, right? And I'm going, yeah, you're good. And you can keep going down this path. And you're just going to, because what is the the old stigma that you have with ag guys? They're, they're dirt rich and cash. <laughs> Poor. Yeah. And so we're going like, how are you then a transition that's in the next level? So we that, that succession plan is one of the biggest things that we do, but it's also being able to access capital. And that's becoming, especially in the last two years, that's becoming a very, very big thing. And you can go to the ag banks and you can finance long term, but I'm talking about the guy that has capital in his bank and he's trying to figure out where the grandson's in a farm and he's wanting that bridge to go okay i'll lend you capital right to make sure you're successful and i'll give you the leg up how do we do that efficiently there there's that's a great conversation i love mm -hmm. to have and then the estate plan is big and i i am 100 percent on board with let, let's get things into multi-generational i want to do a 50-year plan for these ag guys and if I can get a family that's, you know, got a, a section or two section or 20 sections or a lot of my guys have 30 to 100 sections out there now. And that's that's crazy to hear if you're looking at it from a national level. But in a West Texas, it's not it's not that big a deal. Right. Yeah. Having 10,000 acres is not I mean, it's a big operation, but it's not it's not out of norm for us around right. here. Right. It's becoming more normal. It is becoming more normal. Now you go to the I states and it's a little bit different. Right. But I yeah. will tell you are. You know, and we're still at what? It's creeped up here. So I, I got to be careful. So I'm saying 1,800 to 4,000, 4,500 an acre. What do you think land's going for around here? Oh, yeah. Let's just say 2,000 to 3,500. Yeah. So I got some guys that up in Dalhart, a lot of water, right, that are selling for 4,500 to these dairies, which I'm not a huge fan of, but that's a whole different conversation. Like, they're doing what they can do, and they're doing it the right way, but – is you're using a lot of water and it's depleting some of these ag guys but my point is is it, it, the biggest thing that i think i can help the the guys the bridge between multi-generational farming is understanding that you cannot just hope that this thing is going to carry on to the next generation you have to put a plan in place and so when you do that the right way, it becomes extremely powerful and you're moving with intent. And I think that's kind of to your point, like if we can get the guys off of quit worried about getting the crop out of the, the dirt, getting, the, getting it out. And let's look at next year in November. I think that you'll probably be in a better position if you just take a little bit of time, just a week. How long does it take to go through an analysis for you? If you're in November, right before you go into harvest, I get it. It's Thanksgiving. Everybody's wanting to eat some well, fat I turkey. More like August, but uh, okay, all right. So I'm wrong. All right, so it's <laughs> August, right? So well, you you still got the the crop fresh on your mind. You know where things have gone right, where they've gone wrong. Um, depending on the size of the operation, I mean, anywhere from an hour to a couple of hours. I mean, it's, and then, you know, then, so you're not talking about weeks on end. Here. No. And then, so have a couple of hour meeting with Jeff and then go figure out what you're doing in September and August. And yeah, we'll have a conversation. We'll figure out next get off steps the boat in July and, quicker. Uh, you'll let me do all the analyzation and then we'll meet back once the crop is out and, 
and uh, get back together. So it's really about the planning of getting everything going while the har- while the harvest or the growth is up and going, mm-hmm. analyzing that for the last half of the, the harvest season, get your harvest out, and then go back to it. So I didn't understand that, Jeff. That man, man, I love that these That doesn't things. happen. That's the way I want it to happen. Okay. Well, like well, I said, I've got a few guys that, uh, that have come on board with that here recently, and, and we seem to be able to just make a better plan, and we can make tweaks and – one of the biggest hurdles is guys are like, well, I don't want to make a plan because I'm going to have to change it. Well, i got to make my bed every day, and I'm going to change it every night. So it's – But but, but I, the, are you really changing the whole plan? Or are you no, making tweaks pieces. to – Yeah, that's, that, that's such a flawed argument yeah. to its core, right? So make a plan and then, like, you know, here, here's the thing. There's a great guy – hey, Ryan, look this up and tell me what it is. But there's a great guy in, in our industry that says people that fail to plan are planning to fail. Right. And so if you create a plan early on, it's easy to be nimble, to be able to make adjustments, then going, oh, I didn't have a plan to start with. So I'm shotgunning this thing. Right. Well, we saw that uh, going into 22 where nobody had a plan. It looked awful. Everybody's going to just hardly do anything. And then all of a sudden it rains and we hadn't put herbicides out. We hadn't put fertilizer out. You know, it was scrambling and it was just a shit show. Right. And. Going into this year was very similar, but most guys at least learned from that some, experience. Yeah, they, they at least didn't do any, you know, they did something. Right. And hey, before we end, and I keep on carrying, and you got, you got about 10 more minutes here. So, uh, what are we doing with, with crop insurance? What's good? What's bad? What are we doing from a state level? What are we doing from a political level? Where's guys need to pay attention to this? And, and, we haven't touched on this. We should have. Earlier yeah, on. and and I'm not the guy to to. Uh, Who's the guy to talk to? Oh, I could get you in contact with a couple of crop insurance guys that would. Yeah, we need one of those guys on a lot better. Yeah, because that's just because I have questions every year. I'm like, now how is this going to work on your insurance, and why are we doing this? And so it's. But from a but legislative standpoint, every... from a legislative standpoint, I, I mean that's always on the chopping block. It seems like. And it's I think expensive. it's expensive, but I'm seeing a lot of guys that are, I wouldn't say they're farming to fail, but they're farming for crop insurance to a certain year. And I think they're doing that uh, just because they're not set up for success because they see a political environment and they see the weather and then they, they see the cost of capital and then they see the, the input costs and they're like, why? This is the easy button. This is the easy button. I'll put it two inches deep or I'll put it, you know, on yeah. the surface and w- yeah, yeah, you know what I'm saying? But you can only do that so long. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, going through school and you get a zero on an assignment. You don't ever get back to 100 no. for your average. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the the thing is, I would look at, one, trusted advisors. And, and if, you know, I'll give you a plug here. I, I've known you for a better part of a decade now. Um, so I, I trust you. I, I know a lot of guys that we work with together trust you. So w- where's a good way for a website, phone number? W- what's a good way for a guy to, to reach out to you, and especially if you're in Texas? Uh, I mean, the easiest thing is my cell phone. I carry it with me most of the time. So 806-787-6954. We do have a website, uh, forefrontagronomy.com, so F-O-R-E. Uh, very active on Twitter, Facebook. Yeah, TikTok I'll follow from, you on Twitter and TikTok Facebook. TikTok from time to time. So, uh, uh, And we try to put things out that we see happening. We try to put things out that are, you know, you know, coming down the pipe and, you know, just trying to get guys to look down the road just, a, you know, a few days, a few weeks, a few months, uh, knowing that, hey, you know, this we see this trend happening. Let's, you know, let's tackle this. And then, you know, highlight some of the things that we're, that we're doing. Um, you know, I don't try to throw a, a big product download on on everybody on those things and uh and really that's that's how we approach from an advisor standpoint is you know we do have some products that that we love and and we trust and we've been with for a long time and uh but we're not afraid to recommend other things if that's what you need and so uh we let we try to take the emotion out of that and let the let the data tell us what we need to do hey uh, let's do something here i want to chest uh, uh, test this out so so if, if if i got with you and we just did something like a google sheet and we put together a template for what you do and what i do and we put it out there as just a generic overview 
Um, put a comment in place. Uh, send Jeff a text. Uh, you can't text me, unfortunately, but send Jeff a text. Uh, reach out to us somehow, right? And see if that's something of value for you. Because if, if we get some feedback on it, I've been wanting to do this on a couple of industries. Like I said, we did it in the cattle market already. But I'd love to see that, you know, here's kind of what you do and here's input costs. Here's everything that you need to consider. Here's things you need to do on a one year plan. And then I'll do the same thing on a capital structure and the cost of capital and see if we can marriage those two together and see if the consumer out there and the ag, ag producer, because at the end of the day, I really want the ag guy, especially in West Texas, man, be extremely successful. And uh, let's see if we can figure that out. You, you on board with that? Will oh, you yeah. take a look yeah. at that? We we follow kind of a nine step blueprint anyway. See, so I think you perfect. already have it, right? Yeah. And and so, and I'll bring in one of my CFAs. And if you don't know what a CFA is, it's a charter financial analyst. And these guys just analyze everything that there is in the market. And so well, we have analysis on on pretty much everything we can do. We're, we're, we're not experts inside the ag industry, but I bet you we can put together some type of template. And I would like to see where that goes because I bet you we get feedback from, from our ag producers out there that says, hey, Brandon, this is cool template. Can we change this, 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 and this? And we'll put these complex formulas in there where you can't screw it up. You just plug and play kind of deal. Yeah. And, and it just gleans a little bit of perspective inside of what we look at and see if it helps people out. I think that's a great idea, Jeff. Let's see if we can execute on that and, and I think that's a good stopping spot for us, too, because, um, you know, like if you need to reach out to Jeff, hey, give your phone number one more time. But I trust him. I think he's a, he's good and he has good intentions, whatever. And he's very smart. And so, um, you know, he, he comes across like he's just a good old boy, which he is. But he also has that education behind him. So what's a good way to reach out to you, bud? Yeah, 806-787-6954. Awesome. Awesome. Give us some feedback on this. Let us know if there's anything else that's going on. With that, Jeff, I appreciate you coming on, man. I always enjoy having a conversation with you, man. We enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. And uh, if you need anything, uh, reach out to Jeff. Give us one more plug here. What's your phone number? One more time. 806-787-6954. Thanks, Jeff. You bet. Thanks. Talk to you soon.